Greetings, my name is Ryan Fortenberry. I'm assistant professor of chemistry at the University of Mississippi. I have a background in astrochemistry as well as quantum chemistry and I like to use quantum chemical tools to explore molecular origins of life as well as the origins, molecular origins of planets that might support that life. I also have a background in communication and so really what I'd like to focus on with this talk for this audience are better ways that we can philosophically communicate information to larger and different groups of people including fellow scientists as well as the various general publics. I have been working in science communication for a long time and I have some very strong opinions that I would like to share with this audience today, especially with something as difficult as astrobiology, because we get different ideas and different amounts of feedback from the various publics that we are interacting with. I, I wrote a book on this subject uh, that came out a couple of years ago, if you're interested in seeing the long version of this talk in prosaic form. So when the title of the talk is Scientists Should Write Like Journalists. What does that mean? Well, journalism has been around for a long time. It is the essence of communicating news and important information. And I think we've done a disservice in science of writing in a slightly more archaic format that's not as communicative. So I'll talk about that some. Additionally, I think we should speak like cavemen, not me scientist, me do research. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ideas that build group discussion and how when we do scientific presentations or how when we engage with audiences, we should approach the way that we are interacting with the audience and what we're saying in a much more fundamental human way. Now, we've all seen talks and we've all read papers that are just a giant wall of text and the person stares at the screen and we all know that we shouldn't do that. But let's break it down a little bit more. When we talk about science communication, there are three C's that we really must maintain. The first is that anything we say must be clear. And this is, you know, kind of obvious, but also difficult to put into practice because we often have these difficult concepts, especially when we're talking about astrobiology, especially when we're talking about what does it mean to have a biosignature? What does it mean to have some type of signal detection? We have to be clear. And this is, you know, the standard things of avoiding jargon and making sure that we're using terminology that the reader can understand. We have to know whom our audience is in order to be able to construct our messages for those people. But it must also be a fair, I, I argue that much of the writing we need to do needs to have fairly simple construction with simple sentences that are able to put forth information in a clear fashion. As one example, another example of clarity is making sure that we have a direct goal in mind for what it is that we're going to say. And it's, it's difficult for the person who's encoding the message in order to construct a clear message when they have all these different ideas going on, but being able to take a step back and looking at what the audience needs in order to get the uptake of this information. From this, kind of goes with the clarity that I mentioned is concise. We get bombarded with messages all the time. The, simp the, the more concatenated they can be, the easier they are to uptake. Bite-sized chunks are a whole lot better than a big old steak. And of course, the last one is it has to be correct. We don't want to put out information that's false or information that can be misconstrued. So in science communication, clear, concise, correct. I've mentioned a couple of these words, but now let's talk about where they come from. So in 1927, Shannon and Weaver were studying human communication. This was shortly after the telephone had become much more widely available, and there was some concern that we didn't really understand how we were communicating with one another. And this is a somewhat simplified model, and a lot of people argue that it's out of date, but when it comes to a basic idea for encoding information to be interpreted, especially things as volatile as astrobiological implications, it's a good place to start. So when we're constructing messages, when we're talking to other people, especially about scientific things, we often start with some idea in our head. We all have some concept for anything that we're going to communicate. Every word we have has some construct in our brain. Then we take that thing in our brain and we encode it into some symbol, usually a word, and this word can be written or spoken and it stands for something in our head. So we might be thinking about that match we saw the other day and say, man, that football match was very interesting. So we have an idea of the football 
in our head. We've encoded that into a symbol, which we then transmit to someone else. They hear the word football, and they might decode it. And the message that they have in their brain is, might be different than the one that we have in our own. And then they might say something like, football, what are you talking about? And that's then the feedback loop. And then it can continue on. Now, if we're engaging in dialogue or some type of conversation, that feedback loop is very important because it gives us an idea of to continue the conversation, to make corrections, and to construct a message that's repeatedly more refined for the audience that we have. But when we have written communication, we don't often get that. The feedback loop goes away. So we have to make sure that what we're encoding and transmitting can be as clear as possible. And I would argue that if it's concise, it leads to clarity. I also say that there are two very different ways in which science must be communicated. There's the written word, which is really information. Then there's the spoken word, which I argue is not really about information. This is when you're attending a lecture or you're watching a video or something where you have a presenter or a group of presenters that are giving information. Really what you're doing at that point is you're not giving information so much as you are building community. You are building a relationship between the presenter and the audience or between members of the audience with one another. But in any case, we are building relationships, not excuse me, sending information from one person to another. This is why I say that we have to write like journalists because that is where we need to get information. Information is gleaned in a fairly straightforward fashion, the way that our brains are naturally constructed to get popcorn amounts of information. And then the spoken word is about building community the same way our ancestors used to sit around and talk to one another as their principal form of entertainment. We, you know, we watch movies, but really what we're doing is we're watching other people tell stories. It's the same thing, but the medium is slightly changed. And so whenever we have some type of scientific presentation, we don't need to think of it as giving information. We need to think of it as bringing people into our group. Journalism is the written word. And I would argue that we need to construct our research papers, even our research papers, as well as any information that we are sharing with other audiences in the journalistic fashion. This means that you do not develop your conversation and eventually get to some very important point. No, you start with the most important thing at the very beginning whenever you write something, and then it's like your conclusion is the first thing. This seems strange, but if you've ever looked at newspaper articles, if you've ever looked at online news articles or any other place where you get your news, and it's written, what you're gonna find is the most important thing comes first. Then the rest of that paragraph will develop that idea. Then the rest of the body of the text gives more detail and, and more information and maybe some quotes and some other things, but it eventually leads down to where it just stops. There's no conclusion at the end. And this feels weird if you're not trained in journalism, but I would argue that we need to employ these things in science. Because if you get this bit of information from this paper and this bit of information from this paper, if you really care, you can develop it as you read through it but you don't necessarily have to. And so if we have articles about astrobiology, which could potentially be earth shaking, then we need to make sure we get the correct information clearly and concisely at the beginning. Then we develop that idea a little bit more, and then we have more detail for those who are interested in continuing on down, which are going to be a fewer number of readers than who started. I've been fortunate to practice this, where I have been able to write for Scientific American, and this was a very rewarding experience for me that showed me what the process looks like. I had used these techniques, I was able to employ them fairly effectively with the editor, and we had a smooth editorial process. <clears throat> An example of a scientific news article that we could give is this one that came out also in Scientific American before the one that I contributed. A new molecule is found in space. How is this portrayed to the larger non-technical sci but scientifically interested audience? So we have the first beginning part of this research uh, report in this news magazine. 
And it starts off with the lead, something that's catchy, something that's going to show up. And it's saying that some 18% of the human body's weight is carbon. What, what, the, what the author has done here is they have taken the title where this new molecule, benzonitrile, was detected in space. Then they're attaching it to us as human beings. It's mostly carbon. So are we. We have a good bit of carbon in us. And so that's going to be a lead that potentially gets people interested. And then we have information that's going to say what exactly was found. The simplest element considered the backbone of life and is also abundant on earth is also abundant in space. So we're able to say it's present in space, it's present in our bodies, and then move into a larger description. Then we have some more information that follows afterwards that's going more deeply into what this discussion might be so that you can continue to dive into the details if you genuinely care, or you can stop, or you can stop and move on. When we write a scientific paper, I argue that we need to construct our papers as scientists in much the same way, except instead of having one inverted pyramid, we have several that go for the abstract, the introduction, the results. The methods are just simply the process that you use and the conclusions tie it all together. But I also say the most important sentence of the entire paper is the first sentence of the abstract. The first sentence of the abstract. That is the most important sentence because that is what is going to grab people and tell them what your paper is all about. So we can take these concepts of journalism and we can put them into scientific writing. I have been able to do this in my own writing where I have the first sentence of the abstract of this paper, a chemistry paper in an, astro, in a, in an astronomy journal, and I come right out and say that the sheer interstellar abundance of helium makes any bound molecules or complexes containing it of potential interest for astrophysical observation. So right there, we, we, there's this title, it's got some molecules that are out there, but now we have tied the chemical nature to the background of the journal in, in astronomy and astrophysics. Then the next two sentences develop this idea a bit more. We talk about how we did this, some ideas about what was gained, and then we have more detailed information that's pulling down. I do this again in the beginning of the introduction. Come out with a very strong set of statements. That's my lead. It's the conclusion. It's the important thing. It's what I want you to remember. And then all the other things that come from this, the most important ones are feeding that lead in the rest of that first paragraph. And then the rest of this paper, then the rest of this portion of the paper feeds into the first paragraph and the lead to further define what those ideas are that we're trying to communicate. Now, differently, when we do oral presentations, this is when we can use the campfire story model. This is when we can build up to our point. This is where we tell those stories in the standard, in the standard model of literature. It's a campfire. We're sitting around. We're building community. We have our flickering screen. That's our campfire. And then we can go through this traditional model. Now, I've modified it slightly. Usually, it's a, the, the falling action and the rising action are the same length, the way that it's given. But that's silly. <laughs> because most of the time, when we tell stories, most of our discussion is the rising action. We're building. We're building. We get to a climax, and then it falls. And this brings people in. It's a vicarious experience that the audience gets to share with you. And so when I construct my scientific talks, I have a setting, I give a little bit of information about these are the methods that we used, and then it's, and we tried this, and then this happened, and then we build here, and then this, and we got this result, and this was interesting, and then we build up to this ultimate climactic point, and this is the one thing that I want the audience to take from the story that I'm telling, and then there's a little resolution at the end trying to make it go into this traditional model so that we can communicate information effectively in a natural way where we as human beings feel like we're part of the group. We can take all of these ideas, journalism, public speaking, and we can fold them all into an, exter an external public relations. I do this with my own research group, and I encourage my colleagues to do this as well, where we have human interactions, we have news releases, we have papers that we write, we have public presentations that we do, we have recordings like this, we have uh, documents that we put out online where we can share this information with other people. And public relations is this huge discussion, but I would like to argue that whenever we're doing research, we have to keep in mind the public relations that we need to communicate. So, again, I wrote a book. And I took this beautiful picture of the highest point in Texas. And so if there are any questions, 
I would love to talk more with any of you about.